research chemical engineer at the United States Army Armament Research Development and Engineering uh, Center at Picatinny Arsenal in New Jersey. Eric's current primary assignment is to research novel energetics for improved explosive and insensitive munition performance and energetic processing techniques to improve uh, and minimize uh, environmental impacts. Prior to working with the Army, Eric completed a two-year postdoc assignment at the Air Force Research uh, Lab in Dayton, Ohio, during which he uh, worked on polymeric electro-optical devices for light modulation applications. Eric received his BS in chemical engineering from the University of Washington and his PhD in chemical engineering from the University of Colorado with a specialty in polymeric systems. Eric? All right, thank you very much, Rula. I wanted to thank everyone for calling in today to participate in this webinar. Today I'm going to be talking about discussing uh, the use of resonant acoustic mixing, or RAM technology, to generate environmentally friendly energetic formulations. As Rula said, this, uh, this project has kind of, of two forks to it. One is the pressing powder work, and the other is the cascure formulation work. Today I'm really going to be focusing on the pressing powder work, as this has been a little bit uh, stronger on this project so far, and we're just starting to get into our cascure formulation work. Slide 17, please. So the agenda for today's talk is first we're going to talk about project motivation. After that, we'll get into a little bit of the background, uh, discuss some of the uh, resonant acoustic mixing background, talk a little bit about the theory behind the resonant acoustic mixing. We'll then get into some of the basics of pressing powder generation, uh, how these materials are generated currently. We'll then go into the results for the waterless slurry pressing powder generation, and we'll conclude with some conclusions and uh, go into the question and answer session. Slide 18. So the project motivation is um, energetic materials span three basic categories. These categories are explosives, propellants, and pyrotechnics. Each of these formulations are produced in high volumes each year for the Department of Defense. Explosives uh, can um, explosives are main fills, uh, boosters, and fuses, where the boosters and fuses are in the fuse train to help initiate the main fill in the munition. Propellants uh, incorporate small, medium, and large caliber um, propellants and also rocket propellants, rocket motors. Finally, for pyrotechnics, you have flares, illuminants, smoke, and igniters. Currently, there are some processing limitations. The current uh, equipment that's used to formulate all of these energetic materials cannot mix extremely high viscosity materials. Uh, we'll go into a little bit about you know, what are some of the current uh, formulation technology in a, in a couple of slides. Moreover, the waste from these uh, equipment are, are significant, and the cleaning of the equipment requires extensive solvents in order to uh, clean these, these uh, processes. So we need an environmentally friendly processing technique for the high performance materials in order to generate these without causing a significant impact to the environment. Slide 19, please. Resonant acoustic mixing is a fairly new technology that uses sound waves to couple with the formulation medium to perform the mixing process. Uh, traditional mixers use, use blades to generate high shear for the mixing. The use of these blades limits the end viscosity that can be achieved in the mixing technique. However, RAM is a bladeless process that produces Faraday instabilities within the medium for rapid and efficient blending. Uh, recently, Resodyne has determined that it is actually Faraday instabilities where you actually get stalactite and stalagmite type formations within the, that um, mixing media to do the mixing using high-speed uh, photography. It is, uh, it is critical that the bladeless process for this is uh, for our, our application because the, um, the removal of the blades will allow us to make much higher viscosity formulations and allow for much higher uh, solids loaded formulations. Slide 20. RAM has been around for almost about a decade for processing energetic materials. Um, 
for the most part, RAM has been used for highly solids loaded cast cure formulations. Because the, there are no blades involved in this mixing process, you are able to develop what we call extreme viscosity materials that cannot be processed with traditional high shear mixing techniques. Uh, my colleague, Andy, Dr. Andy Nelson, will go into more of these extreme viscosity materials in his talk, so I won't get into a lot of detail on that here. Um, moreover, RAM technology as an application applies to many different areas of energetics processing. It can apply to not only the explosives, but propellants and the pyrotechnics. To emphasize this, there are five ongoing CERDAP ESTCP projects that are related to RAM processing of energetic materials that span all of those three different energetic um, categories. Next, uh, slide 21, please. As I said, for this work, we are focusing on pressing powder formulation. Pressing powders, or molding powders, are just as their namesake describes. They are thermoplastic coated energetic granules that can be um, consolidated into high-density billets through uh, pressing action. To make these granules, you will charge a, uh, a still with the energetic material as shown on the right-hand side of the slide there. You will charge it to about a third of the way full, add water, and start the uh, stirring action to form a water emulsion. A, bind a thermoplastic binder is then dissolved into a solvent to form a lacquer, and this lacquer is added to the emulsion. After the uh, lacquer has been added to the emulsion and stirred to a, a great extent, either a uh, vacuum or a uh, air sweep is applied to the still and the solvent is stripped from the system, thus allowing the binder to precipitate and coat the energetic crystals. And what actually ends up happening is you farm small granules that almost resemble the children's candy nerds uh, to that shape and that size where you have the energetic material on the inside and the thermoplastic binder coating that energetic material. Slide 22, please. These granules are then removed from the still and they're dried to ensure that there's no moisture or solvent present in them. They are then added to a press where they are consolidated using high force and elevated temperature and, and vacuum to avoid any uh, void formation, and they are compressed into a high-density billet. It is this billet that is then inserted into the munition to, uh, for the main fill of that munition. However, there are some drawbacks to this current process. As we talked about, water is required in order to perform this um, pressing powder formulation. And as, um, and as is, is known, RDX and HMX, which are typical explosives that are used in these pressing powder formulations, can dissolve into water at approximately 12 milligrams per liter. In 1995, Health and Human Services came out with a uh, research that showed that the RDX lethal dose 50% values for rats and mice is 71 to 118 milligrams per kilogram. So, this m contaminated water has to be decanted from the still and remediated prior to the release into the environment. This is a very costly uh, process to do, and not always can the RDX or the HMX be completely removed from that, that um, contaminated water. So what we're trying to do in this um, research is develop a way of making these pressing powders without the use of the water. Slide 23, please. So as I said, we are trying to develop a methodology for producing pressing powders without the use of water. So we are using this resin acoustic t uh, mixing technology to basically fluidize our nitromine powder. So we have a mixing vessel where we add our nitromine powder into the mixing vessel. We take our binder lacquer, we pour it in on top, and then the ram fluidizes the material and allows that binder to adhere to the nitromine and then a pl application of a vacuum will slowly remove the solvent from the system and allow the, the thermoplastic binder to adhere to the nitromine and form those granules. Not only that, but through the use of the cold trap, we can collect the solvent and reuse that solvent to make future binder lacquers for future runs. So therefore, there is uh, very minimal, if any, waste associated with this process. 
uh, we have uh, we developed a design of experiment to try and determine optimal uh, processing parameters in order to develop the narrow distribution of the granules and the high um, yield of the granules in this process. Slide 24, please. We chose PBXN5 as our nominal formulation. PBXN5 is 95% HMX and it's 5% Viton. Viton is a fluorinated um, thermoplastic polymer. We identified five factors for the design of the experiment. We looked at particle size distributions uh, utilizing different uh, combinations of class 1 and class 5 HMX. We looked at different lacquer concentrations. We used tetrahydrofuran to dissolve our vitons. We were looking at different uh, lacquer concentrations of tetrahydrofuran to viton. Examined differing G forces of the mixing, the mix time, and the vacuum level. And the, uh, the responses that we are looking for in this design of experiment are particle size distribution, composition analysis, safety data to include impact, friction, and electrostatic discharge, and then the percent solvent collected of the, uh, in the cold finger. For this research, we are really looking to collect our granules in the sieve number 10 and the sieve number 20. And this will give us granule sizes that range between two mil one millimeter to two millimeters in size. And this is our optimal size for this pressing powder. Slide 25, please. So the design of experiment that we chose was a resolution for fractor fractional factorial experiment. In this, we had limited confounding with second order interactions that could be resolved. We performed all runs using a standard mixing vessel, which is about a 1.5 to 1 height to diameter ratio. We chose this mixing vessel because this height to diameter ratio is what uh, was commonly used for the high viscosity cast cure formulations. Um, we had seen in previous past that the, that, that height to diameter ratio allowed for efficient mixing of these high solids loaded cast cure formulations, so that's where we decided to start with this research for the pressing powders. As you can see, we developed a 20-run design of experiment where we uh, altered our particle size distribution, the class 1 to class 5, from 3 to 1 to approximately 1 to 3. Our lacquer concentration was uh, 4 to 1 to 10 to 1. We varied our g-force from 40 times the force of gravity to 80 times the force of gravity, uh, changed our mix time from 10 minutes to 60 minutes, and then we did two vacuum levels where uh, 25 inches of mercury is full vacuum and 12 and a half inches of mercury is a half vacuum. Slide 26, please. Out of this design of experiment, the best results from these initial trials are shown here. Unfortunately, we we're only able to make large, irregularly shaped particles that dominated the collection fraction. In this trial, we only collected 41% of the THF, and only 88% of the granules were recovered as uh, material was recovered as granules. In this uh, in this best initial run, or in this best run, we used um, 70 to 80 Gs within five minutes. And we noticed that there was still residual, high residual THF in, in the uh, granule formation. Slide 27, please. This slide shows our sieve cuts of the material. As you can see, we had significant large granular formation uh, on the very left-hand side sieve there. You can see that the majority, approximately 60% of our recovered mass was in the uh, five mesh sieve. We had very little material in our um, optimal mitt sieves, which is the 10 and 20 mesh. And as you can see on, on the VAR right side there, we had quite a bit of um, pulverized material that turned into very, very fine material that was collected in the pan. Slide 28, please. When we look at the solvent extraction, the blue lines are the full vacuum at 25 inches of mercury, and the orange uh, lines are the 12 and a half inches of mercury uh, half vacuum. As you can see, we collected the most amount of solvent when we used the full vacuum for the, for the run. Um, for, for run 6 and run 11, you can see that we did collect a significant amount of solvent using the half vacuum, but these were runs that were run at very high g-forces for very long amount of times, and we surmised that 
during these runs, the material heated up, and this heating actually allowed more of the solvent to vaporize off. But for the most part, the half vacuum, we were only able to collect at most around 20%, 20 to 30% of the solvent. For the full vacuum runs, we were getting closer to 60 to 70%, but we believe that we were actually getting much higher solvent collection than that. Unfortunately, we did notice that using the cold finger that we had, it was not a optimum cold finger, and we did see some boil off in that cold finger of the solvent going into the vacuum. So we believe that we were actually able to collect more than the 60 to 70 percent solvent as shown on, on the, t uh, the chart here. Uh, slide 29, please. From this initial design of experiment, we did learn some, some lessons that we could translate into some further experimentation. We did see that full vacuum was needed to quickly vaporize the solvent to form the granules. However, we did notice that this high H to D ratio mixing vessels did not allow for the rolling action to round and polish the granules. So we decided to start doing some uh, H to D ratio experiments, but we decided to first use uh, inert materials, sugar, so that we wouldn't generate a lot of energetic waste during these uh, optimization of the mixing vessel. What we did is we started cutting down the H to D ratio from 1.67 to 1.25 to 0.72. And as you can see from the pictures, as you go from the left to the right, we are actually getting better and better granular formation, smaller and smaller particle size granules, as we start to reduce the H to D ratio. So what we found out is that we needed to go from more of a, a uh, high narrow cup to more of a, a hockey puck wide a uh, very short uh, mixing cup. Slide 30, please. So the optimized HD ratio vessel that was determined in these inert runs was determined to be 0.38 HD ratio. Um, we made a few of these stainless steel mixing vessels, and they were made out of stainless steel because we needed to ground the mixing vessels in order to avoid any ESD generation during the mixing um, activity. They also had a slightly rounded bottom in order to avoid any impingement of materials in a 90 degree uh, curve at the bottom of the mixing vessel. So the rounded actually gives you a little bit better mixing capability. We performed a small-scale run of the PBXN5. Unfortunately, due to a slight miscalculation of the lacquer concentration, this run was done at a 90-10 instead of the 95-5 that we were um, originally shooting for. Um, the binder to lacquer concentration was 4 to 1 THF to Viton. Slide 31, please. In the small scale runs, we did three runs where we altered the total mix time, the amount of time that we apply a high vacuum, and the amount of time that we apply a very uh, high uh, G-force for the um, polishing and rounding of the material. In run one, we did a total mix of 22 minutes. For all runs, we have an initial period where we have no vacuum and 60 to 60G uh, mixing force in order to wet the material with the lacquer. After that first initial three minutes of wetting, we then apply a full vacuum. In this case, from run one, we applied a full vacuum for four minutes, and we upped the mixing um, force to 70Gs. After that four minutes, we turned off the vacuum, and we uh, increased the, the mixing force to 100Gs for the remainder of that mixing cycle. As you can see here, we had over-dried irregular granules, and the vessel walls did have some residual residue. But we are getting quite a bit of material in that minus 5 to 10, plus 10 mesh, and the minus 10 to plus 20 mesh that we were shooting for. Slide 32, please. So run two, what we did is we reduced the total mix to 21 minutes by reducing the vacuum duration to three minutes. Again, we had that initial three minute 60G no vacuum wetting period. Now we had three minutes of full vacuum at 70 Gs. After that three minutes, we again upped the um, G force up to 100 Gs for the rounding and the polishing. Here we, we saw that we were getting less of the over dried material. It was slightly over dried, and it was slightly irregular granules, 
but the vessel was becoming partially self-cleaned. We were getting a greater uh, recovery percent. Here we recovered 82% as particles and 96 of them were in the correct bins. So we were trending in the right direction. Slide 33, please. For run three, we reduced it to 20 minutes by reducing the high vacuum duration to two minutes. Uh, again, three minutes for wetting, two minutes for high vacuum, and then the remainder of the 100 Gs for the rounding and polishing. And as you can see from the results here, we got nearly ideal, highly spherical granules. The vessel was mostly self-cleaned because we were able to recover 94% of the material as particles. And more importantly, 99% of those were in the correct bins as shown. You can see that the majority of the material is in the, the minus 5 to plus 10 mesh and the minus 10 to plus 20 mesh. We had two small granules in that plus 5 mesh, and we had very minimal material of, of the very small um, granule sizes in those far right-hand mesh uh, bins. So here we, we settled on what, what we determined to be the optimal mixing and, and generation of that material. Again, we were able to recover 94% of particles and 99 in the correct bins. We believe that we could completely clean uh, with slightly longer runtime and, and actually increase that 94% closer to 99%. Slide 34, please. So we uh, took a sample of this optimized run and we ran it for compositional analysis. Again, the nominal composition was 90% HMX, 10% Viton, and the actual composition came out almost spot on with 90.05% uh, HMX and 9.95% Viton. So you can see we had a, a extremely close match between the actual and the nominal composition. We did some scanning electron microscopy of the materials and we saw that it shows very good coating of the energetic material with the, uh, the Viton um, thermoplastic material. Slide 35, please. So with this process, there are some DOD benefits of this. First of all, we have identified an alternative manufacturing method for producing pressy powder formulations. This is a manufacturing risk reduction for the, the production of these types of materials. Not only that, but we have increased the throughput for the pressing powder formulations. Typical slurry coating of these materials takes about four to five hours to complete, where we have now reduced that manufacturing time to between 20 and 30 minutes. Slide 36, please. So the conclusions of this work here is that, number one, we have the, the resin acoustic mixing technology has wide-ranging benefits to energetics processing. Um, you, it reduces waste via mix-in item, as Dr. Andy Nelson will talk about next, and it allows for continuous mixing, um, which was not discussed here, but there is a, uh, Residine is actively looking at continuous mixing capabilities. More, moreover, for this project, we showed that we can eliminate contaminated water for the pressing powder generation. We demonstrated a waterless process for pressing powder generation that that generated narrow distribution granule formations with very high yields. And we are currently looking into scaling up this process to larger quantities to further demonstrate proof of concept. Slide 37, please. I just wanted to acknowledge a few of the people that worked on this. We had a contractor, Rocky Mountain Scientific Laboratory, that did a lot of the work on the pressing powder optimization. And the two uh, scientists that worked on that were Ross Nellums and John Kosak. Uh, here at the U.S. Army Armament Research Development and Engineering Center, we had quite a few people that worked on this. Uh, Paul Anderson and Christopher Pizzo from the Explosives Research Branch. Uh, Henry Grau, Alexander Gadzenko, and Robert Decker did the, um, uh, particle, or did the uh, compositional analysis and the SCM analysis. And then uh, Philip Samuels from the Explosives Development Branch. Slide 38, please. So if you need any additional information on this program, you can go to the website that's noted on this slide. Uh, this project is WP2604. And at this point, I will uh, take any questions from the group that have been uh, collected so far. Great. Thank you so much, Eric, for a great presentation. Uh, before we start with the Q&A session, I would just like to remind everyone to submit questions by using the chat box on the left-hand portion of the screen. 
Uh, for starters, we actually uh, received a question from a resident, and the question is as follows, Eric. Was any mixing done with inert materials in a clear vessel to visualize the mixing mechanisms? Yes, absolutely. Before we went to the stainless steel uh, container, we actually utilized uh, polypropylene containers to visualize the mixing process. And that's where we determined the uh, vacuum duration and uh, some of the um, H to D ratio optimizations that we did. And, and actually using the clear vessels and using sugar as an inert simulant proved to be uh, very valuable in the determination of some of those processing parameters. Um, you know, with the stainless steel, you can't see through that, so you can't really see what's going on. The, the polypropylene containers, although the um, you know, the material might not interact with the container vessel exactly the same with the polypropylene as opposed to the stainless steel, but it did allow us to visualize some of the mixing um, interactions that were going on in that and allow us to optimize some of those uh, mixing parameters. Great, thank you. Uh, a second question it is related to whether uh, the uh, RAM is only a laboratory scale piece of equipment, or can it be scaled to larger quantities? Yes, yeah, so Residine actually makes um, three different types of resin acoustic mixers. So the laboratory scale one is, is they make two variations of that. There's a LabRAM 1, which has about a 500 gram scale, and then they also make a LabRAM 2, uh, which they make two variations on that, that has a 1,000 gram capacity to it. Uh, in the LabRAM 2 series, they have an intrinsically safe LabRAM 2H model, and then they have a non-intrinsically safe LabRAM 2 model. Those are the laboratory scale equipment that are used uh, to prove everything out. To go to the pilot scale, they do make a five gallon mixer, that's the RAM 5, and again, that has a five gallon capacity. And then for production scale, they actually make a 55-gallon mixer, which can be used for, as I said, those production scale quantities. Uh, thank you, Eric. Is the RAM primarily used for explosive formulations, or does it have other utilities for um, different aspects of energetic materials? Yeah, so the, the RAM technology can be used, as I said, across the board for a lot of different energetic materials and actually can be used for non-energetic materials also. Um, you know, making, um, you know, if you needed to add any type of solids, energetic or non-energetic, to different binders, you can do that effectively and efficiently in the RAM. But moreover than not, the RAM is actually has a high uh, utility in the pharmaceuticals industry where they're using that to generate a lot of their products. So the RAM technology can be used extensively for energetics, non-energetics, um, for making high solids loaded systems, for effectively mixing powder-powder mixing, for powder-liquid mixing. So it's its applications stretch across the board for significantly different applications. Great, thank you. And what obstacles do you think uh, need to be overcome to scale up the pressing powder work to pilot scale and production scale levels? Yeah, so the, the obstacles that we need to overcome are going up in size and, and developing those, those stainless steel containers that will fit inside the, uh, the RAM 5 and the RAM 55 to increase the amount of material there. Uh, as with anything, when you scale up, there's always going to be some optimization in the uh, parameters that you need in order to do the mixing. And what we need to figure out is, you know, are the parameters that we have developed herein going to scale directly as is expected for the RAM for larger quantities? So when we start going up to that five gallon mixer, are we still going to be at that 20 minute mark using the, the uh, three minutes of vacuum? Or are we gonna have to apply a little bit shorter, longer duration? Are we gonna have to make some alterations to the H to D ratio of the uh, mixing vessel itself? We don't anticipate there's going to be major changes to any of those parameters, but we do need to um, verify that, that you know, the scale-up of this is um, 
is quite linear to uh, from the RAM the lab RAM to the RAM 5 to the RAM 55. Great, thank you. And before we move on to Andy's presentation, what can you tell us about the costs associated with the RAM technology relative to other mixing technologies? Um, that one is a little bit harder to to get deep into. I mean, the the laboratory scale equipment is, is actually quite inexpensive. The Lab RAM one only costs about uh, fifty thousand dollars, thirty to fifty thousand dollars, depending on the accessories that you get. With a Lab RAM two being closer to a hundred thousand dollars. But for the what you get for that amount of money is is you know you can apply that technology to a wide varying different uh, applications of um, solids loaded binders systems uh, everything like that um, you know when you start talking about throughput of these materials when you start getting into reducing the throughput time from four to five hours for a still based pressing powder to 30 minutes in a RAM 5, you will greatly decrease the cost of the material just based on the throughput of that material. So by using the RAM technology, you know, you may have a little bit of a capital investment to get the material or to get the equipment, but the based solely on the throughput and the reduction in the, uh, in the amount of waste management that you have to do, the, the cost of the material itself should come down quite significantly. Great, thank you so much. And with that, we're gonna thank Eric and uh, recognize that towards the end of the webinar, we'll be able to pull him back in to answer additional questions. But at this point, I'd like to go ahead and uh, introduce our next speaker, who is Dr. Andrew, uh, Andrew Nelson. Um, Andy is a senior research chemist at the Naval Air Warfare Center Weapons Division in China Lake, California. He has worked as the principal investigator of a variety of basic and applied research and demonstration projects related to the development and demonstration of new rocket propellant and explosive technology. Most recently, he has worked with uh, the RAM technology to produce novel high energy propellants and PBX formulations. He has authored more than 30 peer reviewed um, publications um, and patents. Um, he earned his B.S. degree in chemistry from Bethany College and his Ph.D. in organic chemistry from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Uh, Andy? Yeah, thanks, Rula. So today I'm going to talk um, to you, for the most of the part, and, uh, about a project where we're using this concept that we've coined as mix-in case uh, for the green processing uh, using RAM technology. Uh, if we move on to slide 41, it's just a basic agenda of what the talk is going to entail. Uh, we'll start out with a problem statement which, which highlights uh, the current technology for what we're going to call mix and then cast of uh, high performance composite materials. I'll go into a very brief overview of what resonant acoustic mixing is, although Eric did an excellent job with that. And then I'll actually show you some pictures of the RAM machines that Eric described in answers to one of the questions um, that he got as far as the scale of these machines. Um, a couple of slides on some of the advantages of RAM, and then we'll get right into you know, the meat of the talk, which is to define what the old paradigm is, which, which is mixing and then casting of explosives. Um, and then the new RAM paradigm, which allows you to mix inside uh, the case of the desired end item, and then we'll um, come around with some conclusions at the very end. Slide 42. Uh, this is the problem statement. So high energy composite materials are currently produced in batch style mixers or kettles or tumblers or extruders. You saw a picture in Eric's talk um, of a slurry kettle. I'll have a couple of pictures uh, in this talk of what, the, what we call you know, impeller blade Baker Perkins style mixers. And it's a mix and cast process. And so it requires a lot of energy. It requires a lot of labor. And then it requires an awful lot of solvent to clean up um, the batch style mixers. Um, it produces large quantities of hazardous waste, not only the material that's hung onto the blades or stuck to the sides of the bowls or stuck in the plumbing of the apparatus, which we'll see some pictures of that a little bit later in the talk, but also in terms of the solvent um, necessary to clean the batch mixers up. And it also imposes some significant risks in terms of health and safety to the operator. Somebody has to go in with a paddle and scrape the material off of the blades, and if you have friction-sensitive material, you can, um, you're imposing a risk on the, on the personnel. Also, you have to go in sometimes with full-blown Tyvek suits uh, because of the amount of uh, volatile organic chemicals that are used um, to clean up these things. 
So anyway, so new processing te uh, techniques are needed to eliminate the, the use of batch style equipment. And so some of the DOD benefits are going to be cost. So that's the big driver. We're going to produce less material in the, in the production environment that I'm going to describe today. Um, we're going to uh, produce, or we're, we're not going to spend, uh, you know, money on the disposal of that hazardous waste material. Uh, the, the process that I'm going to describe is more agile. Um, the RAM uh, machines don't necessarily, because what we're, what we're doing is we're going to strap in item cases onto the top of the RAM machines. They don't necessarily care what material it is that they're mixing, and the machine doesn't have to be cleaned up at the end. So you can, you can be more agile in your production. You can go from mixing one material to another uh, to another without having to clean the machine up in between and making it look spotless so that you don't get contamination. And then again, I mentioned safety. We're going to reduce the exposure of personnel to these high energy materials and the vol volatile organic chemicals associated with cleanup. On slide 43, this is just a basic introduction to what RAM is. We're going to be mixing with high intensity, low frequency vibration waves. Eric had an excellent picture in his presentation um, that's taken off of the, the Residine website about the sound waves going up and down um, through the material. The cartoon that you can see there on the lower left hand side of the screen is a schematic of what the resonator looks like on the original Lab RAM 1. And if the, if the, if the, uh, if the movie was working, which it's not because I pulled it out of an old presentation, you could see the item going up and down, the green bar going up and down as the springs elongate and compress on the top and the bottom. Uh, but the, one, the thing I wanted to point out on this slide is that the, the red can that's on the top of the mixing platform, that's what you're mixing in. And so for what, what we're trying to exploit with this technology in this program is the concept if you can bolt it to the platform, you can mix in it. So you don't have to have a separate bowl. You're not turning the material with blades. If you can, if you can visualize a way to strap down what you want to mix in onto the vibrating platform, you can mix composite materials in it. As we move on to slide 44, uh, this is just a picture of the RAM machines that we have here at China Lake. Uh, Eric got the question about the scale of these, uh, of these machines uh, at the end of his presentation. So shown there on the left-hand side of your screen is the original Lab RAM 1. Uh, it's nominally a pint mixer holding roughly around 500 grams um, of material, and it has the ability to be integrated with vacuum and temperature control, but those are separate items um, that you could either buy from Residine when you bought the machine, or you could hook them up uh, to your existing uh, infrastructure. In the middle picture is the Lab RAM 2. This was an upgrade from the Lab RAM 1 in terms of total capacity. It's got a larger uh, voice coil motor on the inside, which turns it from a pint mixer into what we call a quart mixer uh, with a capacity um, of around a, a kilogram of material. And this one came from Residine with integrated vacuum and temperature control uh, built into the machine. So it's an upgrade all the way around. And then on the far right-hand side of the, of the slide there, you can see the RAM 5 mixer at China Lake. Nominally five-gallon capacity, 37 kilograms of material, or roughly you know, between 70 to 80 pounds. Uh, this one at China Lake uh, comes intrinsically safe. It's a, it's a uh, dry air purged machine that's kept under positive pressure so that if we dust the environment uh, with energetic particles, uh, we're still maintaining a hazard classification of class one, division one uh, with our RAM 5 machine. Uh, neither of the lab RAM uh, models that we have at China Lake are, are intrinsically safe or hazardous location rated, um, but we have protocols in place for dealing with the materials. We always bring the material that we want to mix sealed uh, to the lab RAM, mix it on the lab RAM, take it away from the lab RAM to another uh, building before we open it. So at no point are the lab RAM machines exposed um, to the energetic material. Uh, at the bottom of the, of the slide there, you see with an asterisk that there is a RAM 55 available, nominally 55 uh, gallon uh, capacity. Uh, you can make a lot more material than you can with the RAM 5, but conceptually it looks very much like the RAM 5 that's on the uh, right-hand side of your screen. Uh, slide 45, we're going to go into just a few of the advantages of the RAM technology, and the first one is safety. And so we've talked a lot about how there's no blades. If there's no blades, there's no pinch points. If there's no blades, there's no blades to, scream, to, to scrape and clean uh, during the material. Um, but the one thing that we want to highlight on this slide is that we often at China Lake and other places work with brand new materials that we don't have any idea what the safety parameters of those materials are. And so those materials are the most dangerous things that we work with. So our protocols are, are to use remotely controlled machines to mix, the, to mix these materials. And the Navy has a regulation that we start very, very small to reduce the risk uh, to our personnel. No more than five grams of material in an initial composite mix. The problem with that is, is that all of the blades 
related mixers that we have access to at China Lake and other places that I'm aware of will only mechanically mix materials uh, remotely at, at, at quantities around 25 to 50 grams, which is, you know, five times more than we're allowed to do uh, under the Navy's regulation. And so historically, these small five-gram mixes have been mixed by the operator by hand behind a blast shield. So this puts the operator in, in undue risk, uh, you know, as far as we're concerned. The major advantage of the RAM technology when it first came out, uh, and, and the reason why we were able to sell it to our safety committee is a really good idea to get in on the ground level, is that the RAM doesn't care the size of the container that you strap to the mixing platform. Again, if you can, if you can bolt it to the platform, you can mix in it. And so the picture on the upper right-hand portion of the slide there shows a, a small container, <clears throat> nominally um, it holds about, it, it's completely full, it will hold about 25 grams um, of material, and you can see that we can hold six of them there. Uh, on the bottom, you see a couple of containers that we have mixed material in open. Uh, you, can see, you can see finished uh, propellant material there. Those are mixed at five grams, and so we can mix as little as a gram of material with remote control, which is a major advantage, because now we can get away uh, from making hand mixes, which put the uh, operators um, at risk. If we move on to slide 46, another advantage of the RAM is that it's very, very fast. So Eric described uh, in the introduction to his presentation about the Faraday instabilities and how rapidly um, that, that mode of mixing trend, um, converts the material into a uh, very homogeneously dispersed composite material. Uh, on the right-hand side of the screen are the bullet points for the bladed mixer. Normally, for the bladed mixer, you make multiple material additions. Usually, a quarter of the solids or, or, or less is added to the bowl at a time. The blades are turned on for 10 to 20 to maybe 30-minute mixing cycles to fold the material in, and this process can take four to six hours, and it's limited by the material viscosity. A bladed mixer, for safety, for safety reasons, has uh, incorporated into its mechanical workings, things like shear pins, that if the material gets too thick, uh, the shear pins break and the blades stop mixing. The RAM, on the other hand, on the left-hand side of your slide, you can put all the material in the pot at once. You can develop single-step mix routines where you turn the machine on for a very, very short amount of time, and it rapidly homogenizes the material um, in, in uh, mixing processes that are as, as little as five minutes. Um, and we're not as limited by material viscosity. Eric mentioned this idea of extreme viscosity materials, which we're going to get to in the next couple of slides. Uh, but the bottom line is increased production rates, which you saw in Eric's presentation, is going to equal increased profits and decrease, um, decrease cost overall. If we move on to slide 47, uh, this is what we mean by extreme viscosity. Um, and extreme viscosity for us means access to new materials that we couldn't get to otherwise in our bladed mixers. If there are no blades to mix, there's no blades to stop. And so you can get into viscosity regimes that are completely inaccessible uh, with legacy technology. Um, increased viscosity in our world means increased performance. All of the plastic bonded explosives, rocket propellants that we normally work with, are formulated at the limit at which you can get solid oxidizer or solid explosive into a binder matrix. If you could put more in, you can get more explosive performance out. But the cast cured explosives that we work with are limited by viscosity because you have to be able to keep the blades turning with the legacy technology. So if you can increase the viscosity, you, can, you, you do that by just increasing the solids, which means increasing the performance. The other, uh, the other aspect of increasing viscosity is decreased sensitivity. So there's a phenomenon within explosive particles that if you can make them smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, it decreases their susceptibility to initiation by, um, by shock or by sympathetic reaction. If one bomb goes off, the next bomb goes off. And that's one of the aspects that we're trying to eliminate with DOD munitions. So if you can decrease the particle size of the oxidizer going into the binder matrix, you can decrease the sensitivity. The problem is, is as you decrease the, the particle size, you also increase the surface area and you uh, increase uh, the viscosity of your material to the point where legacy um, technology won't mix the material. So again, with the RAM technology, because there's no blades, there's no blades to stop, you can get into viscosity regimes that are just completely inaccessible. The pictures on the bottom of the screen um, show a material that we mixed. Um, at the time that we turned the vibrating table on, you can see the time that it takes to flow this material to the bottom of this container. So we're almost at four and a half minutes 
Uh, normally with a, a, a classic plastic bonded explosive, the time that it would take to flow all the material out of that small 500 gram container would probably be 30 seconds. Um, and in some cases, we've made materials that you can measure the hardness of the material at the end of the mix prior to putting it in the oven to cure. Um, and so essentially, if the material will move under the vibration that you can, that you can access using the RAM technology, you can mix it. If we move on to slide 48, <clears throat> we'll get into the meat um, of the presentation. We're talking about what uh, the pictures here show what the old regime looks like. It's a mix, it's a mix process uh, on the picture in the lower left-hand corner. Uh, you see a bowl uh, that's going to be rolled into a mixer with blades uh, over the top of it. You're going to mix the material in that bowl, and then you're going to transport that bowl to a casting facility uh, where you're going to raise it over your head or you're going to roll it over the top of a casting pit, and you're going to cast the material through a series of, of uh, pipes uh, on the bottom of the mixer into the end item. So on the picture on the right-hand side, you see an operator standing underneath um, a large mixing bowl casting materials into a large rocket motor. So that's the old, that's the old way of doing things, and it um, requires cleanup of the mixer. It requires cleanup of the bowl. It requires um, pushing all of the excess material out of the plumbing and cleanup of all of those um, existing parts. If we move on to slide 49, this is the new mix and case paradigm that's, ac that's available to us uh, with the RAM technology. In the picture on the, on the upper left-hand <coughs> portion of your screen, you'll see a warhead, you'll see a headspace extender, you'll see a rubber gasket, <coughs> and then a vacuum RTD cap. And so the process here is to assemble those, put the, headspace, put the gasket on top of the warhead, put the headspace extender on top, of the, uh, on top of the gasket, and then you can see in the picture on the far right-hand side of the screen, um, the warhead assembled with the headspace extender on the top, and we're loading raw ingredients uh, into the warhead case. The binder ingredients go in first, uh, followed by the explosive solids, followed by the curatives and the catalyst. Everything gets assembled with the vacuum cap <clears throat> with the RTD going down into the material so that we can measure the uh, temperature of the material as we mix, <clears throat> as well as pull a full vacuum on the material so that we can degas it as it's being mixed. And then the assembled warhead <clears throat> gets taken to the lab ram, bolted down to the mixing platform, and the machine gets turned on uh, for the prescribed amount of time um, and acceleration. After it's done mixing, you simply take the, take the uh, warhead off of the machine, take it to the curing oven, leave it in the curing oven for the prescribed amount of time, uh, take it out of the curing oven after it's cured, trim it, which is the pictures that are shown there uh, on the lower left-hand portion of your screen. That's a finished warhead that's been trimmed over the top. And then right next to it is an x-ray uh, of that warhead showing that we've got <clears throat> no voids um, in the in the material. So this is the new mix and case paradigm where, again, if you can figure out how to strap it to the mixing platform, you can just use the end item that you want to go out and test or you want to go out and field um, as, the, as the mixing bowl, if you will. And at this point, you have no machine to clean up. You have no mixing bowl to clean up. And you eliminate all of the, all of the material that's hung on to uh, the plumbing associated with the uh, alternate casting method. If we move on to slide 50, um, this is a hold-down fixture that we developed at China Lake uh, specifically for the LabRAM 2. As I mentioned in earlier slides, the upgrade from the original LabRAM to the LabRAM 2 increased the payload capacity, and so we were able to move from uh, mixing in a single warhead at a time to developing this fixture that ho holds three warheads at once. Um, this was a major increase uh, in the time that it took to produce uh, warheads, and we'll get into in a few more slides uh, where, we, where we are in terms of comparative um, production mixes at the lab scale in producing these warheads using the RAM technology as well as uh, using uh, legacy uh, bladed technology. If we're moving on to slide 51, I always get the question when I give these presentations of how good is the mixing? Uh, because if you can mix things in as little as 10 to 15 minutes, how are you sure that the material is really homogeneously dispersed um, and you're getting out of the uh, you're getting out of the, the, the mixer the material that you want. So we made two different plastic bonded explosives. We've labeled them plastic bonded explosive A and B. Uh, a is a bit more uh, of a thick material. It requires around 15 minutes uh, of mixing at a variety of accelerations to get the material moving, get the material hot, and then get the material degassed. The global standard deviation, we mix this material in that three warhead configuration three warheads at a time, and then we sampled those warheads rather than curing them at the top and the middle and the bottom of each warhead. We made triplicate um, 
measurements of the composition uh, of the explosive particles in there, and we ended up with a global standard deviation of all of those measurements of, of, of the number that you see there, 0.217 weight percent. Uh, the second plastic bonded explosive that we did this experiment with is a much more fluid material. It's got an end of mixed viscosity that's probably closer to 1 to 2 kilopoise, whereas PBXA is closer to 20 kilopoise, so an order of magnitude or so drop in material viscosity. Again, the same experiment, three warheads on that, on that, um, that warhead holder that you saw in the previous slide. Um, sample the material top, middle, and bottom at the end of the mix. This mix, this mix process takes us about six minutes uh, to put this material together, and you see there that the global standard deviation is very, very small, uh, less than a tenth of a weight percent. And just for perspective, the mill spec for both of these materials allows for plus or minus two weight percent of the total solid. So we're getting very, very good mixing, very, very uh, homogeneous disbursement of the solids within the binder ingredients, even at very, very rapid mix times. If we're moving on to slide 52, what we did under this ESTCP program is we did a lab scale production demo um, um, using the LabRAM2 as the mixer. Uh, the stations there, you can see, uh, you pictured on your right, you can see the, the guys uh, working to load the, pre load the binder material in the warhead first, and pass it over to station number two where the explosive material is loaded as a coated explosive material. That's what CXM means. Station number three is where we put in the isocyanate curative, the catalyst, and the antioxidant, all the small ingredients. And then station number four is where we assemble the vacuum cap before it's handed off to the LabRAM2 operator, which is not pictured. Um, we did this production demo, and then we also did a one-gallon mix-and-cast operation using the Baker-Perkins mixer that I showed you about three slides um, back. If we move on to slide 53, uh, this is what the lab looked like on the upper left-hand portion of your screen. Uh, you can see the benches there where everything's assembled, ready to, to start the operation. On the right-hand side of your screen, you see the same uh, picture of the lab. It's unfortunately been rotated um, 180 degrees, but the lab was cleaned up. You can see all the warheads there in the middle of the picture um, that we made, and then you can see this black Velostat bag with a red arrow pointed to it. That's where we collected all of the hazardous waste. Uh, the volume of the solvent uh, necessary to return the lab to this level of cleanliness uh, was measured by refilling these bottles up to the red line where they started um, at the beginning of the operation. We did this lab scale production using the mix and case paradigm on the lab RAM 2, as well as a separate mix and cast uh, regime using our, one of our one gallon uh, Baker Perkins mixers. If we move on to slide 54, uh, we're getting higher quality products using this mix and case um, paradigm than what we got out of our mix and cast. Uh, on the right hand side of your screen is the, is the material that was mixed in a Baker Perkins bowl and then cast in a separate operation into the warheads. Uh, for those of you that are on the line, you can probably guess as to why we only made uh, 17 warheads in this operation and 18 warheads in the mix and cast operation. Uh, I did not account for the material that was going to be hung onto the sides of the bowl or onto the sides of the blades in, in the casting operation, and so we, only, we ended up with one less um, warhead. If you look at these x-rays, um, the second bullet down there says that seven of the, of the warheads would likely be rejected uh, for void content, and two of them are questionable. What that means uh, basically is that we got nine different warheads out of the 17 that we made that had air voids left in them. Uh, due to this mix and then separate cast operation. If you look over on the left-hand side of your screen in the mix and case, we made 18 warheads, six different um, lab ram operations to mix three warheads at once. Uh, there are three warheads, there are numbers 10, 11, and 12, they're in the middle row of all of those x-rays um, that would likely be rejected for void content. One of them is questionable, that's warhead number two on the top left-hand portion um, of the pictures with a single um, air void out of it. Uh, warheads 10, 11, and 12 were all one single mix and cast operation. And um, we had a very difficult time getting the vacuum caps to seal around those warheads for whatever reason, and that's the reason why those didn't come out uh, looking as perfect as the, as, the other, um, as the other warheads. But in general, we're getting higher quality products using this mix and case um, than we are getting out of our normal you know, mix in a bowl and then cast in a separate operation. If we move on to slide uh, 55, uh, it's faster production. Uh, in the mix and case uh, paradigm, we made 18 shape charge jet warheads. We made 45 grams of material. It took us three and a half hours of operation. We had originally calculated that we thought it was going to take us two and a half hours to get this completed, but as I mentioned, we had issues 
uh, getting vacuum caps to seal. We had to stop the machines a couple of different times, reseal the vacuum caps, turn the machine back on. Um, the crew that we had turned out to be 17 and a half man hours. Uh, you know, we, we extrapolated out that if we could make 18, uh, shape, or 18 warheads in three and a half hours, we could make 41 warheads in an eight-hour shift, uh, which turns out to be less than a man hour per warhead uh, using the five-man crew uh, that, we, that we used. Um, in looking back at the operation, we didn't necessarily need uh, a separate person to install the vacuum caps and then take the warheads uh, to the lab ram. The lab ram operator could have done that as well. And so, again, calculating out for a four-person crew, now we're talking about just over three quarters of a man hour per warhead. Um, in contrast, the mix and cast operation, we made 45 grams of material using our one gallon mixer. Again, we only got 17 warheads out of that mix and cast operation because I did not uh, appropriately account for the amount of material that was going to be stuck to the bowl and stuck to the blades. That total operation took us eight and a half hours. Uh, we, had a, we had a smaller crew, um, 26 man hours total. We had two, two people on the mix and cast. We had, we had two people on the mix. We had two people on the cast. Uh, we made, um, you know, we, we guessed that in an eight-hour, um, guess we calculated in an eight-hour uh, work shift we'd make 16 warheads, uh, which is, you know, roughly one and a half man hours uh, per warhead. So we've increased the production going from a mix and cast operation uh, to a mix and case paradigm. If we move on to slide 56, uh, this is where the rubber meets the road for the CERTIP and, and ESTCP organization. Uh, we've reduced the environmental impact going from a mix and cast operation to a mix and case. Uh, you can see the first bullet point there is the total amount of solvent uh, needed to clean up the lab uh, using the mix and case uh, versus the total amount of solvent used to clean up the mixer and the lab uh, in the mix and cast operation. And so that's about a, that's about a five fold decrease uh, in the solvent uh, required to return everything to the standard level of cleanliness. The total amount of hazardous waste produced uh, on the lab ram operation is 672 grams or roughly uh, just under 40 grams uh, of waste per warhead. Contrast that with uh, well over one and a half kilograms uh, of material produced in a, in a um, in a standard Baker Perkins mix and cast operation. And the bottom line is, is that the RAM operation decreases the cleanup solvent by almost 80% and the hazardous waste by greater than, by greater than 60%. If we move on to slide 57, this is where we're going in this, uh, in this project in the full-scale production. So the picture that's shown there on the left is a fixture that we designed for our RAM 5 machine. So in the RAM 5 machine, the hold-down fixture uh, actually, submerge, uh, actually submerges itself into the resonator. Uh, you can see that the concept is basically the same. The gray uh, cylinders that you can see in the middle of the picture, those are the warheads. The white cylinders on the bottom are just a centering ring that goes around the warhead to keep it chattering left and right. Uh, within the hold-down fixture. The white cylinders on top are the headspace extenders that allow us to load all the raw ingredients um, that take up more volumetric space. The whole thing gets bolted down with a cap. We designed the fixture to run with seven warheads um, at a time, and we are probably <clears throat> two or three days away from doing our, our first inert mixes uh, in these warheads to verify that the material won't go uh, anywhere that we don't want it to go, that it all stays inside the warhead and that we're safe to, to um, move on. Uh, to our energetic mixes. If we move on to slide 58, <coughs> excuse me. So these are the conclusions. Uh, RAM uses high energy, uh, sorry, high intensity but low energy vibration waves to mix anything that you want to, as long as you can strap it to the mixing platform. Uh, the advantages include improved personnel safety, uh, improved production speed, uh, access to new higher viscosity uh, novel materials that you can't get to otherwise, which increase the performance of our current, uh, you know, Navy qualified or Joint Service qualified materials, but also decrease the sensitivity of some of those materials so that we're giving the warfighter more performance uh, and, and better sensitivity. And then the advantage of mix and case is to eliminate all of the waste associated with mixing inside a bowl that has to be cleaned up or mixing with a machine that has to be cleaned up uh, post-mix. Uh, some of the mix and case uh, benefits obviously improve production. Uh, we can speed up the production rate, at least on the lab scale we've been able to show that. What we're trying to do on the full scale production with that seven warhead hold down shooter that I showed uh, a slide back is try to match the production that you can get out of a much larger mixing bowl. The industry currently works on 300 uh, gallon and 600 gallon. Decrease environmental impact. Uh, there's no waste associated with uh, a machine that has to be cleaned up. And then decreased facility infrastructure. If you're mixing inside a warhead case, <clears throat> for those of you that understand quantity distance relationships, 
you don't have to have 600 gallons of material that you're putting energy into. You're only putting energy into the material that will actually fit inside the end item case. <clears throat> and we're on slide 60. If you want, um, I'm sorry, slide 59. If you want more information about this project or, or Eric's project, uh, you can go to the CERTIP ESCCP website. Uh, the project number for this project is WP2015-07. Uh, uh, you can contact me. My, my contact information is, is uh, listed there at the bottom. And uh, with that, I'll entertain any questions. Great. Thank you so much, Andy. We have a number of questions for you. Uh, can you please uh, explain what some of the issues may be that are um, maybe associated with employing the RAM technology in an existing energetics processing facility? <clears throat> yeah, so I mean the first one is, um, well, the first one is if you if you got in on the ground level when the when the RAM technology was first introduced, uh, the original lab RAM was not <clears throat> hazardous location rated. Uh, it wasn't built to be that way, um, and it's it's an invaluable research tool, but it didn't have that application. So there are a number of things that you could do to convince your uh, safety folks to, um, to allow you to operate that material with energetics. The one that we rounded on that I think is the best is that we bring the material sealed. So we load all the ingredients into the mix container. We seal that mix container we bring it to the machine. Uh, the machine is never then exposed um, to uh, hazardous materials. Um, but in moving forward, uh, Residine has been uh, very, very proactive in our industry. So they now offer a Labram 2 that is hazardous location rated. It should be plug and play with almost everything that you can do in an energetic processing facility. Uh, the only difficulty is, is you have to have a couple of things that maybe you don't necessarily have uh, in your energetics facility. You have to have dry air so that you can purge the, <clears throat> so that you can purge the resonator and keep it under positive pressure, and it has to be dry so the, the electrical components uh, inside uh, the, the com communication box as well as the resonator um, are not exposed to moisture, and that's the same on the RAM 5. Um, the only other aspect that you have to really think about is that if you're, you know, you're developing a fixture that's going to be bolted down for a mixing case or for, as Eric described, uh, a short squatty container for making uh, molding powders, you do have to think about um, you know, metal on metal contact as you as you bolt those materials together, and how well the how well the vessels are sealed so that you don't get uh, material that spills out of the vessel. But the machines themselves um, are coming from Residine for our industry as Class One Div One machines, and as long as you have the appropriate utilities, it should be there should be no issues with with um, with integrating this technology into your current uh, explosive processing facilities. Great, thank you, Andy. Um, are there any safety concerns with the RAM at both a lab scale and larger scale, for example, with RAM 5 or RAM 55? So the safety concerns as you scale up these materials are is that the material will heat up on its own. Um, as it mixes uh, using the vibration waves. And so as you scale from lab scale to RAM 5 to RAM 55, um, that that hysteri or that um, that hysteretic heating of the material or frictional heating of the material as it bounces around on the inside of the container uh, becomes more and more prob more and more of a concern. So you have to have uh, better cooling capacity as you um, as you scale the material from the lab scale up to eventually up to something like a RAM 55 mixer. Uh, other than that, um, since most of our operations are run uh, remotely, uh, you don't have to necessarily worry about the sound uh, that's produced out of these machines. They can get quite loud when they're running at very, very high accelerations. Uh, if you're standing next to the machine, if you're doing inert trials, then obviously you want to have uh, hearing protection, um, things of that nature. But from a safety perspective, I think the primary one to concern yourself with is just the self-heating of the material during the mixing process because of the, um, the intense uh, friction that can, be, uh, that can sometimes be produced as the material is getting incorporated, wetted, and then eventually mixed. Thank you so much. Uh, is there a practical lower limit to the amount of material that you can mix on the labram? So with composite case, or with, I'm sorry, with composite pastes material, um, we've seen effective mixing down in, in as little as a gram of material. There are some folks that have been doing dry powder powder mixing of, of very, very sensitive uh, thermite uh, pyrotechnic material, and they're going into the milligram uh, regions and still getting very, very good mixing um, in blending those dry powders. With a paste, 
Um, I don't. I, I won't say that there is a practical limitation as far as you know. We we're mixing in a gram because that gives us enough material to go and do a safety test. You could probably get away with milligrams um, of material if that's uh, what you had available uh, and you were primarily concerned uh, with the sensitivity of the material. But I don't know that there is a, a, an absolute practical limitation. I know people that have made um, composite blends, you know, with um, less than a gram of material. Thank you. And then finally, have you seen uh, performance differences when comparing RAM-produced material to material produced using bladed mixers? Yeah, we have in, in some cases, and they're not dramatic, but I think that they are uh, measurable. But I also think that there's something that can be overcome. So I'll, I'll talk about two different um, applications. First of all, in rocket propellants, we've made we've – made, um, uh, you know, AP containing rocket propellants using the LabRAM technology. And, and one of the things that we don't see in terms of performance differences is really much of a difference in terms of burning rate of the propellant. And, and why that's important is it shows that the, that the RAM technology is not artificially uh, milling the material that you wouldn't necessarily see uh, in a slower moving uh, impeller blade type of process. But where we have seen some differences in the performance of the material is in the uh, stress and the strain, the mechanical properties of the material. We, we've seen it on two different projects now, both on an explosive side and on a propellant, where we've gotten slightly decreased strain capability um, out of a rocket propellant and an explosive that have come out of both the lab RAM scale and the RAM 5 scale. And it's measurable, but what I think is actually going on is that we're getting better disbursement of the material and we're actually getting more effective cross-linking out of the material that's coming out of our RAM mixers than what we would have seen uh, under our Baker Perkins mixers. And so I think it's something that can be overcome with just formulation. On the explosive performance side, those little warheads that I showed today that we did the mix and uh, in, in case uh, demonstration. We are seeing more variability in the, in the shape charge jet performance um, of the warheads that are coming off of the RAM mixer uh, than we saw that are coming out of the Baker Perkins mixer. But we also had fewer good warheads to test coming out of the Baker Perkins um, um, one gallon scale mix and cast operation than we had good warheads to test coming off of the RAM mixer. And so some of the variability may be just in terms of test setup and, and what would be n normally understood to be variability within those warheads. We did not match the explosive well to the to the copper shaped charge liner. We just we had a warhead case that we wanted to fill. We filled it with a material that we knew we were going to be able to mix. Um, and so that may be um, that may be the answer for some of the variability, but there are there are at least uh, some performance uh, differences with that particular explosive. Uh, thank you so much. And then uh, at this point, I'd like to pull Eric back in. And uh, starting maybe with Eric, can you please um, uh, tell us where the RAM technology originated from historically? Was it pharmaceuticals, stains, or what are some of the things, the drivers for developing uh, RAM technology? Eric? Yeah, the, the RAM technology is actually a, a, a good news story for the Small Business Innovative Research Program through the, the U.S. government. The, the RAM was actually developed under a uh, Air Force uh, SBIR program um, and actually, you know, to, to, to develop uh, that technology. Went through the Phase 1, Phase 2, and, and to the Phase 2E trials and then finally went into production. So this is actually one of the really good uh, stories for the SBIR program with regards to actually um, developing and commercializing a product. Um, as re with regards to, you know, the commercialization of this uh, product right now, it, it's really centered on the two main areas of its use are, as I said in my talk, um, the pharmaceuticals and the engineer and the explosives or the, the energetics world. But it does have other far-reaching applications for just about anything that you need to do powder powder blending, pow liquid powder blending, um, high so high highly solids loaded formulations. Andy, would you like any to add anything to this? No, I think Eric covered it. Yeah, I'm started under an Army SBIR, and um, yeah, I mean it's it's seen great utility within the pharmaceutical world. But yeah, it started uh, yeah it started in our industry for making uh, gel by propellants. Um, so yeah. Wonderful, Eric. Have you compared um, 
then the sensitivity of classical mix and cast warheads versus RAM warheads, particularly uh, in terms of insensitive munitions tests. This is a question from Luterdine. Um, we have done limited on that. Uh, as far as we can tell, the sensitivity of the material does not change that much from legacy mixing to the RAM mixing. Uh, as Andy said, we do feel that we're getting better exfoliation, better uh, deagglomeration of the material. Uh, so we, we do see, if anything, we do see a slight reduction in the sensitivity of the material, but we haven't done extensive research into that aspect of it at this point. Andy, would you like to add to that response? Yeah, I'll say that um, so we have measured, if, for those of you that are on the line that are familiar with um, you know, gap test shock sensitivity measurements, we have measured uh, both on a small diameter, half-inch diameter, uh, what we call the insensitive high explosive gap test or IHE gap test. We've measured the uh, response of Navy qualified explosives, uh, both coming out of the RAM technology as well as material that was you know, standard mix and cast. Uh, Baker Perkins, those numbers are within two or three cards uh, of one another, um, and really right on right on par with what um, is is you know currently in our literature for most of those materials. We've scaled uh, a couple of those materials up to the RAM 5, and we just recently got data back um, last week on one of the Navy qualified explosives, it's actually explosive that was in the mix and case uh, warheads that I showed today. And again, we're within one or two, maybe three cards. Uh, of what is expected nominally for this material coming out of larger production batches. So I think that we're seeing very, very few uh, changes in the sensitivity of the material going to the RAM process. Now, the, the second part of that, the answer to this question is, is that it, we can make these materials, we can make some of these Navy qualified materials, we can drastically reduce their sensitivity by changing the particle size of, of the explosive particles that go into the mix. And so we have made uh, materials where, you know, taking a Navy qualified qualified explosive taking all the large particles out, filling it back in with all small particles, the viscosity goes way up, we're still able to mix it. And in those cases, we've seen dramatic decreases um, in the card gap sensitivity, as much as 50 cards um, a decrease in sensitivity going to the material that we can mix in the RAM. But that's really changing the particle size and the viscosity of the material. Thank you. And um, this is a question from BAE Systems Land UK. Do you do any crystal packing or distribution analysis uh, on the warheads to see if explosive crystals packed differently around the cones compared to the rest of the warhead? And are there any differences between the RAM and blade mixer um, observed? Eric, why don't we start with you? I'm going to have to defer that to, to Andy because that was the work that he was doing. I, I don't have really much information on that. That's fine. Andy? Yeah, so this is a great question. <clears throat> and unfortunately, the answer is, is that we haven't gotten that far in dissecting some of these warheads um, to actually look at the, the composition of the material right up against uh, the shape charge jet cone. We are we are seeing some, like I said, more variation in the material uh, that's coming out of this mix and case paradigm uh, off the off the lab rams. Um, and and some questions that are in our mind are whether or not um, during the initial wetting phase where the material is dry or it's being incorporated into a wet paste, whether or not we're getting some abrasion of the copper liner that's leading to some of the variable uh, variables that we're seeing in the test. But yeah, unfortunately, we have not gotten to the point. Uh, where we've dissected these warheads to look at the at the structure of the crystals or the makeup of the um, of the crystals in close proximity to the liner. I will say, based on our composition analysis of looking at the warheads, you know, the top, the middle, and the bottom, we're not seeing any difference in the composition. We're not seeing any difference in really the, the distribution of the large particles versus the small particles. But there still is a question in my mind as to whether or not we're doing just a little bit of of uh, a braiding of the copper liner that's leading to some of the variability that we've seen. Thank you. So, so Rula, let me, let me just add one little thing to that. So we have done some analysis in the past where we have done, uh, made some higher viscosity, almost like Play-Doh type materials, uh, and we took it to a, a focused ion beam SEM uh, analysis, and we did see that we were able to 
deagglomerate or, or exfoliate the material almost completely using the RAM technology where you otherwise don't see that in a high shear mixer. In a high shear mixer, you do still see a lot of the agglomeration of the material where the action, the, the mixing action of the RAM does seem to deagglomerate, exfoliate that material quite a bit more extensively than, than the high shear mixers. Thank you so much. Um, what aspect of the RAM technology do you think has the largest future reach within the energetic processing community? Andrew, can we start with you, please? Yeah, that'd be, yeah, great. Um, so, I mean, there's, again, twofold answer to the question. I think that if your production facility, generally speaking, makes a relatively small um, items, some of the you know some of the medium caliber, some of the shoulder launch type of things that that are prevalent in our community. Then I think that then I think the largest future reach for those types of systems is this idea of mix and case. And the way that we describe this to to visitors that we have to our facility, uh, high brass people that want to come in and and see what we're doing, is we describe something that looks very much like a coke bottling plant, uh, where the warheads or the rocket or the small rocket motors or the or you know whatever it is that's a part of the weapon system that's relatively small or running down a conveyor, raw materials are being loaded into those uh, end items, they're running to the end of the line where, where they're either being loaded by a robot or by a person into the lab ram, uh, I'm sorry, into the ram 5 or the ram 55 depending on the scale, um, and then the machine is run for a very, very short amount of time to mix those uh, end items. They're taken out, taken to a curing oven, and the next batch is ready to go. So for smaller items, I think that is the future reach. For larger items, for the really big rocket motors that go onto some of our surface launched tactical applications, the scale of the RAM technology right now is, is really too small to get into that industry. Even at 55 gallons, most of these uh, end items are cast out of 600 gallon production mixers, and a 55 gallon mixer is just not really going to compete very well for these large end items. However, what Residine is doing right now is they're developing what we're calling a continuous acoustic mixing process where it's a, 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 a stack of cascading plates and baffles where the material goes in at the top unmixed and as it transverses this uh, cascading uh, plate design, it comes out the bottom of that material as a finished product and then through a delivery system can be uh, directed directly to a casting pit where you're loading uh, these larger rocket motors. And I think that for the propellant community um, that deals with, you know, rocket motors that are on the order of uh, you know, a ton of material or multiple tons of material. I think that's actually the largest future reach in the energetics processing community, particularly for rocket propellants or really large, um, you know, bombs um, or end items. Thank you so much. Um, Eric, would you like to add anything to this? Yeah, I think one area that, that could also be a, a far-reaching um, benefit for the, the RAM technology, as, as Andy explained earlier in his talk, is a lot of our materials for these cast cure formulations come out of Holston Army Ammunition Plant as CXMs, or um, basically lightly coated uh, energetic material with either the binder or the plasticizer. Uh, all of that, my understanding, is done in, in slurry kettles. I think that the RAM technology could increase the throughput of these CXMs in the ability to, um, you know, quickly coat the material and get it out the door to the end manufacturers for that uh, for that material. So CXM, I think, has you know the CXM generation has a, a large cap uh, capability for another application for the RAM. Thank you so much to both of you for uh, answering the questions so well and also for such great presentations. Um, as we wrap up, I'd like to remind our audience that the next webinar in the SIRTUP and ESCCP series is on Thursday, June 14. It is titled Approaches to Managing Threatened, Endangered, and At-Risk Bird Species. Uh, this webinar will feature two speakers, uh, Dr. Richard uh, Fisher of the U.S. Army Engineer Research and Development Center and Dr. Randy, uh, I mean, Brandt Ryder of the Smithsonian Mi Migratory Bird Center. Uh, registration is open for this webinar, and um, 
other webinars for 2018, so please make sure to visit the CERDAP and EACCP webinar webpage uh, web to register. Um, before we conclude, and as uh, Robin mentioned, um, I would uh, appreciate it if you could please take a moment to complete the survey that will pop up on your screen shortly. Um, and I'd also like to remind you that an audio and a copy of the presentation of today's session will be archived on our webinar webpage in case you would like to refer to them in the future. Uh, this concludes today's webcast. Thank you so much for your time.